The book of Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read a lengthy uh, portion of scripture that you can remain standing for. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, and I'm going to skip around just a little bit, but I will begin reading with verse number 8. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Just pause here and tell you that when you're living right, you'll always have accusers. Skipping down to verse 12, then certain Jews whom you have set over the fairs of the province of Babylon. These are the Chaldeans speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar in this verse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king, verse 23. And these three men, everybody say three men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. Then, verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke to his counselors and said, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth man is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. I want to preach to you for the next few minutes something that's been burning in my spirit the last couple of weeks. Look at your neighbor and say this. Say, you don't smell like what you've been through. (laughs) Now, why don't you turn to somebody else and say, thank God you don't smell like what you've been through. Lift up your voice together to the Lord with me and let's ask him to talk to us for the next few minutes of this service. Would you do that? In one mind and one accord, Jesus, we come to you and we ask that you would release your word to do its perfect work, God. Nothing that is by bite or by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Lord, I pray right now that you would loose my lips to deliver what you put in my spirit. I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us. Fill somebody with the gift of the Holy Spirit today. Change somebody's life. Turn somebody's around. God, I pray that you would let somebody step into their destiny. Somebody understand their purpose today. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 And you can be seated in Jesus' name. Every one of us have had the experience that there are certain places that you go that that place lingers on you when you leave. (laughs) There are certain places you visit that the aroma that is in that particular place permeates the fabric of your clothing and gets in your hair and on your fingers and you walk away and you do a little smell test 10 minutes later and you say, who is that that stinks? And then you realize, it is I, (laughs) oh Lord, that stands in the need of prayer. It's me. You, you ever go to, a, anybody ever been to a Waffle House before? 
Anybody got your favorite little greasy spoon diner that you go get breakfast at once in a while? You can't help but walk in that place smelling one way and walk out smelling like the grease that they cooked your bacon in. <laughs> you walk out smelling like this cocktail mixture of pancake batter and bacon grease and fry oil and cobwebs in the corner and a greasy mustache on the cook and <laughs> you smell like it all. <laughs> but you walk in a smoky little gas station and these chains smoking behind the counter and you get out and you smell like you've been chain smoking. <laughs> you smell like because the smoke has got all over you. There are some foods that you cook in your house that the aroma fills the place. And you get used to it because it, it, it's like the, the frog in the pot of water, right? You put it in cold and slowly turn up the heat and it don't jump out. But you get in your house and start cooking up all that goodness. And maybe you're frying bacon or maybe you're cooking some curry or whatever you're cooking. And fl flipping some hamburgers, frying some chicken, whatever. And, and all of a sudden you walk out of your house and you smell like where you just came from. You stink. Or people walk into your house and they say, whew, it's got a little odor to it. Got a little smell to it. We use our smell, one of our five senses, as, a, as an identifier, as, a, as a, a sense of identification. We identify objects and things and people through what we smell, what we sniff. You can't walk down the aisle of Target without seeing some little lady in there sniffing candles. <laughs> some of you are those little ladies. <laughs> you come back from vacation and you open up your refrigerator and you see some food in there that you left when you left. <laughs> and you got to give it a sniff. Anybody do that? Give it a little sniff. And, ah, it's probably still good. We just put it on for an extra 30 seconds and it'll be all right. <laughs> or you open up that carton of milk and, yeah, I mean, it's like, ooh. You find out if it's something. Now, are, now are, some of you, are some of you like milk date people? Like whatever that date is, when that date expires, it's done. Are there any milk date people here tonight? Today? Anybody here? Don't be ashamed. The Lord sees you in your sin. Just don't be ashamed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but then there's some of us, I mean, I grew up, now I grew up, you didn't have to worry about the milk going bad because the milk was powdered and in a box in the cabinet. <laughs> Provided by the government. <laughs> that was the original stimulus package. Canned cork, uh, can, not cork, pork. <laughs> Powdered milk and processed cheese. <laughs> That's where it was at. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, oh. and when mama wasn't looking, you'd slip in an extra scoop of the powder to make it a little extra. I mean, you felt like you were living high on the hog. <laughs> you have to smell that milk. Let me tell you, you don't want to smell that milk. <laughs> there is a better way. <laughs> You smell that milk, and I, 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 I'm the kind of guy, man, you just, it might be past the date, but you just give it a smell and a little swirl. If there's no icebergs floating in there, then you're, then you're all right. They don't kill you, make you stronger, right? <laughs> might do some of y'all good to smell some milk. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> we, 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 we smell cologne, perfume to see what we like. Some of y'all, how many of y'all ever done this before? <laughs> See, you know. <laughs> you know. The other ones are like, huh? Y'all know what that means, right? <laughs> Smelling your own breath. <laughs> hey, let me just help you. I don't know if this is in the Holy Ghost or in Levine, but let me just help you. If you got to smell your own breath, just put a mint in. I mean, just, just go the extra mile. They're cheap. I'll give you one from my pocket. <laughs> just if you, if you got a check, just, I mean, when in doubt, throw the mint in. Just, it, it'll help you. <laughs> the smell test. We, we, we use our nose to 
identify. And others use their nose to identify where we've been, what we've been exposed to. Some of you parents remember when you were raising teenagers and you'd, you'd smell them when they came home on a Friday night because you were checking where they had been. You could tell where they had been and what they had been around or who they had been around. The book of Daniel, the prophet, tells us of this, this man Daniel and his three friends who passed the smell test, if you will. These were men appointed by God, anointed by God. And in their story, we find that they are taken through a trial. They're taken through a trial and they are even delivered into the fire. But we find in reading their narrative that God didn't just allow them to be cast into the fire, but God went into the fire with them. Can I tell you here at the very beginning of this message that whatever God allows you to be put in, He will also go in there with you. That you will not be alone. They're cast in the fire and God delivers them out of the fire. And what I've come to point out today is when they're delivered out of the fire, there is not even any evidence that they were ever in the fire to begin with. I'm here to preach to somebody today that not only is God able to take you through the trial and the tragedy, but God is able to remove the identity that is stuck to you of the trial that you've been through. I've come to preach to somebody today that not only is God able to deliver you, but God is able to deliver you not just from the fire, but God is able to deliver you from the lingering identity that the adversary would want to attach to you an identity of tragedy, an identity of trial, an identity of trouble. Let's take a look at their story a little bit together. You can follow along. It'll be on the screen. But in Daniel chapter 3, we read the account, the narrative of these men, Daniel and his three friends, his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You may know them by their given Babylonian names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were members of noble families. And somewhere around 605 B.C., they were carried off captive into Babylon. Can I tell somebody today that God has put nobility in you? Irregardless of your last name or where you grew up or what neighborhood you're in, God has put nobility in you. God has put his royal blood in you. And there is nothing that the enemy would love more than to carry off captive what is God destined to be royalty. They entered into Nebuchadnezzar's training program. And Nebuchadnezzar is now schooling them and, and training them because the adversary always wants to spoil God's purpose in your life. And what you need to know is, is the adversary doesn't just spoil God's purpose in your life with one incident or one failure or one misstep, but they were entered into a training program in Babylon. The enemy wants to wear your mind out and wear your spirit down. And he wants to, over the course of time and the erosion of circumstance, uh, he wants to change and alter your God-given identity. That's what they were subjected to. They were, they were subjected to this training program because it was Nebuchadnezzar's intent that their identity would be compromised. Hear me today. If your identity is compromised, you will always wind up captive. If you allow the adversary to compromise uh, your God-given identity, it will always lead to captivity. Uh, it will never lead to liberty. Uh, I've come to charge somebody today. Don't compromise your godly identity. Do not compromise your God-given identity. Uh, don't compromise with the Babylon or this world. 
You've got to understand, to to really apply this story, you've got to understand that Babylon was more than a country. Babylon was a culture. Babylon was more than a place. Babylon uh, was a spirit of the day. And it's the spirit of our day. And Babylon was a continual temptation. It was a continual cultural pressure against the people of God. This is why the prophet Jeremiah would chastise the people of God and he would tell them, you're trying to bow down and offer incense to the gods of the Babylonians and you're also trying to bow down and worship the one true living God. What you need to know is that God is a jealous God. He will not share your worship with any other God. There are some folks that will try to blend their worship. They'll worship God on Sunday morning, uh, but they'll bow to something entirely different on Monday afternoon. I said they'll worship God uh, on Sunday morning, uh, but on Friday night they're dancing to a whole nother tune, honey. But what you need to know is God will never bless uh, any child of God that tries to bow to the world and bow to Him. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three men, the the meaning of their Jewish names is is of significance in the story. It literally meant Shadrach, the the gift of God. Hananiah, the gift of God. God, Michelle, literally one who is like God, and Azariah, his name indicates the Lord God who helps, and as we see by the end of the story, because they stood for God, the Lord God helped them and assisted them. If you want to get out of the trial, and if you want to escape the fire, if you want to celebrate what God did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we do ourselves well to examine why they were delivered. How did they live? What did they do? Or what did they not do that qualified them for divine deliverance? There's a couple of things very quickly that stand out to me. First, we read in the first two chapters of the book of Daniel that these men were praying and praise-filled men. These men were not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill Jews that were into captivity, but they were praying men, and they were praise-filled men. And the easy application, the simple application is that God will always show up for a praying people, and God will always show up for a praising people. You can, you can get form and religion and ritual a lot of places. There, there's places all over the Quad Cities. There's, I'm sure there's places all over the state of Illinois and all over the Quad Cities that, that you can sing a song, you can sit in comfortable chairs, uh, you can have good lighting and sound and musicians. But God doesn't honor just some religious form or ritual. God honors prayer and praise. In other words, God's looking for true, authentic spirituality. Well... Let me help somebody. This is not a creative arts venue. This is the kingdom of the living God. Let me help somebody. This isn't where you show off your Sunday best. This is the church of the living God. This isn't some Sunday social club. This is a soul-saving station. You can get lights and music at a concert. Uh, You can get creative arts in university. Uh, This is a place where lives are transformed uh, and drug addicts are delivered uh, and marriages are put back together. And honey, that doesn't come because of light sound in a show. That comes because somebody's been praying. And that somebody that comes because somebody's not just lifting their hands out of routine, but they are truly inviting the presence of God to come down and dwell. Can I just pause here and tell you, that's why what we do uh, up to now in the service is so vitally important. That's why you can't afford to come in here and sit on your hands uh, on Sunday or just kick back, uh, relax, and say, well, I wonder if the preacher's going to move me today. Uh, You got a problem, Jack. Uh, You ought to come in here and say, I've come to move God. Uh, I... 
I don't care who's preaching. I don't care how good he's preaching. I don't care how good they're singing. I've come to touch God with my prayer and my praise because somebody's about to be delivered today if I can get heaven to come down. They were praying men. They were praise-filled men. And these young men were different. They weren't like everybody else. The word of the Chaldeans in verse number 12 said, These Jews who you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, O king, they have not regarded thee. They have not reserved your gods. They have not worshipped your golden image which you have set up. They said, King, these guys aren't like everybody else. Hear me, hear me. Let me be crystal clear. If you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you don't have to just try extra to be different. You don't have to make an effort to be weird or to use the biblical world, uh, word peculiar. If you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, the people around you will know there is something different about you. Don't get all upset when they talk about how you're different uh, because that puts you in good company. They were different than the world around them. The Bible says uh, they were one God in their lifestyle. Everybody say my lifestyle. I'm preaching this Sunday morning that your lifestyle matters to God. Daniel chapter 1, it says that they refused to eat the king's meat or partake in the king's portion. They refused. They had the royal food. They had the best prime rib and fried chicken. And they had the best everything spread out in front of them. And they refused. I'm sorry, it's lunchtime. I know. I know. Hey, we don't have a Sunday night service. You got all afternoon. Gorge yourself. <laughs> Let me preach a little bit, okay? They said no to the royal table. They said no to the best meat that could be provided. You know why? Because that meat and what was being provided would have been considered unclean by their God-given laws, by their God-given boundaries. It would have been unclean for them to partake in that. And so they were challenged in their stance, these four men. These four men, the Bible says, uh, they, were, they were challenged and they were provoked. Uh, they said, no, we're going to eat grains and we're going to eat fruits and vegetables and we're going to drink water. That's where the concept of the Daniel's fast comes from, by the way. And, and they, they said, we're just going to eat this certain type of food. And, and the people who were working for the king got all nervous. And they said, wait a second, you're going to get all emaciated and you're going to be weak and anemic. And, and how, are you gonna, how are we going to show you to the king? How are you going to be of any strength or worth if you don't eat this good food? And they said, just watch me. <laughs> You've heard me say it a hundred times. Time is a tattletale. Just watch me. Just, just, just stand by. Just watch. I'm telling you, if given time, living for God, living a godly lifestyle will always prove 100% of the time, without fail, it will always prove to put you on the winning side. Every single time. And what God did was the Lord honored their commitment after they had eaten only their food and they had rejected Babylon's food. The Bible says they were stronger, they, were, they fared better, they looked better. And watch this, in verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, And for these young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature. In other words, God didn't just make them physically strong, but the scripture says that God gave them wisdom all the stuff that Babylon was trying to teach them 
God said, because you're living a godly lifestyle, I'm going to teach it to you. It's just going to come across a little different. I'm going to teach you. And at the end of the day, you're going to look better and you're going to be wiser and you're going to know more than all of your worldly counterparts. In fact, the Bible says they were 20 times, or in verse 20, it says they were 10 times better than every other competitor. I'm, I'm just telling somebody this one. I'm preaching to somebody. You can go the way of the world, but you can't take enough supplements. You can't read enough books. Uh, you can't spend enough hours in the gym. You can't practice enough, uh, research enough, uh, get enough degrees on your wall to end up in the same place uh, that you can end up uh, if you just make up your mind. I'm going to live for God, and I'm not going to partake in the lifestyle of Babylon. I'm not... Am I preaching to anybody this morning? You see, the lie of the enemy is that the enemy wants you to think that you're in a losing battle trying to live for God. The enemy wants to warp your thinking to think uh, that you're going to lose if you try to live a godly lifestyle. But time will tell that it will put you on the winning side uh, because God did not create you to conform. God created you to stand out. You, you, you may, you, you go through this life, you live for God, I promise you, you're going to feel like a cultural misfit. You're going to feel like you don't fit in. You're going to feel like you don't belong. That's okay. That's all a part of God's divine plan. God didn't create you to fit in. You can't lead people that you fit in with. You can't save people that you blend in with. You're a called out people. You, you can't always run with the crowd and be God's chosen man or woman. And I'm telling somebody today, the longer you try to blend in and the longer you try to fit in, the longer you delay your God-given destiny. The longer you try to blend in, the longer you put off God's purpose being ever realized in your life. There's somebody here today that you're frustrated by the purpose of God not coming to pass. But it might just be that you have lost God's purpose because you have blend in with the Babylonian culture around you. They were one God in their lifestyle. They were one God in their worship. They didn't just live the life, but when it came time that the challenge was presented to bow down, they refused to bow down to the gods of this world. Now, now listen, let me just explain this real fast. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had set up a golden image. He built an idol of self. Do you realize that's exactly what this world is doing? Yes. Erecting an idol of self. My decisions and my way are the God in my life. Yes. It's whatever I choose. It's whatever I want to be. It's whatever I want to do. I am a God and a law unto myself. This is not a new concept. It's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He built a 90 foot tall image of self <laughs> 90 feet tall that that's nine basketball hoops stacked on top of each other just to give you perspective that's nine story building a 90 foot tall golden image and it wasn't just 90 feet tall it was 90 feet wide that's massive that's massive can i just tell you in today's culture you don't see the 90 foot tall image but there's some folks walking around that got just as big of an image of themselves in their mind <laughs> There's some folks walking around that they got just a big image, an idol. Oh, I worship God. I worship God. I'm a one God. I'm a Jesus name. I'm Holy Ghost filled, sanctified, living. Yeah, but you serve self all week long. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> You don't submit to any authority in your life. Uh, you're a renegade. You're a maverick. You're a, you're a lone ranger. God don't bless that. You only bow to the image of yourself, uh, your ideas, your ways. It, we can't see it 90 feet tall, but we can see it. <laughs> Trust me, we can see it. It's 90 foot tall image and he commands that they're going to bow down. Now, you, you know what? They didn't bow. They, they, said, they said, we're not going to bow. We're, we're not going to bow. 
Now, here's what they could have done. They could have said, hey, listen, I serve God in my heart, so I'll just conform outwardly. I'll just bow outwardly, but in my heart, I'm still serving. There's some folks that think there's this great separation between what you do in your heart and your inner man and what you do in your outer man. The Apostle Paul ripped that distinction apart when he said, what starts on the inside will be evidenced on the outside. (laughs) They could have said, we're going to bow with our bodies, but we're going to stand with our hearts. Uh, but, But that would have not been pleasing to God because truth does not bow to culture. The truth of God's word will never bow to what is culturally popular or what is culturally acceptable. We've got a whole cultural drum beat that's being played. They played this music, and when they played the music, everybody was supposed to bow. you got to understand, we got a whole cultural drum beat uh, that's playing in our world. And everybody is expected to bow. And everybody's just expected to accept it. And everybody's expected to just say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, or yes, they or them, or whatever you're supposed to say yes to these days. Uh, but you hear this preacher, God's word never bows, uh, and God's people... And the disciples of Jesus Christ do not bow. Now here's what they did not do. They did not say, well, you knucklehead, will you bow and I'm better than you. I'm not bowing. Psh, you, what, kind of, what kind of chump are you? What kind of, you're, you're, they, they, didn't, they didn't badger anybody. They weren't Bible beaters. <laughs> no, you know what they did? You know what the best thing you can do in culture is just sometimes just shut your mouth when everybody else is bowing. Go ahead and bow. Whenever, see, he can't, it's not even in him. He can't do it. (laughs) You know the best thing you can do sometimes? Get off social media. Quit spouting off to everybody. The best thing you can do is when everybody else is bowing, You just stay firm, and you just keep standing, and you just keep living, and you just keep being righteous, and you just keep loving people, and you just keep living for God. Thank you. And when you ask me, I'll tell you, but you know what? I'm not going around trying to thump anybody in the head. I'm just going to keep standing for truth. I'm going to keep standing for righteousness. I refuse to bow. Now, you got to understand, in the Bible, they threw them into the furnace, right? They're going to throw them into the fire. We don't throw people into the fire today. You know what culture does? Culture tries to humiliate you. They try to ostracize you. They try to cancel you. They, they try to do away with you. They try to silence you. They try to pressure you. That's what our culture does. Just keep standing. Time is a tattletale. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. They said, listen, the God that we serve, you can do what you want, but the God that we serve, he is able to deliver us. These little tattletales run to the king. I got to hurry. In verse 8, these little tattletales run to the king. These little Chaldeans, they run to the king. It wasn't even Nebuchadnezzar that saw them standing. It was some little tattletales in the kingdom. And they said, hey, did you see they're not doing it? They're not doing it. Have you noticed that like like the social media police are all over the place? Cultural police are everywhere looking for anybody who is counter-cultural, looking for anybody who disagrees. You got people running around afraid of their own shadow. God has not given us a spirit of fear. I'm not preaching, I'm not giving you a license to be ignorant or rude, but God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's always going to be accusers in culture. They said, hey, King, do you know those, those people, they did not bow. They, re- they refused to bow. They knew what the consequence was going to be. They could be thrown in the fire. There has always been, since Daniel's day, a choice between the fire and and the image between bowing to the image of culture or being given to the fire of wrath and fury and indifference from the culture there's always been a choice since the beginning of time why would you think that God would get to the last 
50 years of the church or the last 100 years of the church and change his mind and just say, all right, I was just kidding all those 2,000 years. Y'all just blend in now. You know, that that's just a joke. Just blend in. Just do what you want now. No, that's not what God says. Here's what they said in verse 17. They said, if that is the case, Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to throw you in the fire. And verse 17 of chapter 3, they said, if that is the case, the God who we serve is able to deliver us. In other words, you can do what you want, Nebuchadnezzar, but the God who we serve is able to deliver us. How many know God's able to deliver you? Yeah. Now check this out. But if not, where's my verse? Verse 18 of chapter 3. But if not, if he doesn't deliver, be it known unto you that we still will not serve your gods, nor will I worship the golden image that you have set up. So I believe God can deliver me. But guess what? Even if he doesn't deliver me, I'm still standing firm. I'm not going anywhere. I'm preaching to somebody, that's what it's really like to serve God. To make up your mind, whether I burn in the fire or I'm miraculously delivered, I'm still going to stand. I'm still going to be firm. My feet are still planted on the rock of His Word. You know the best way to get delivered? You know the best way to get delivered is serve God. They served him faithfully. Some folks want to just wake up and serve him when they get in the fire. <laughs> they touch the flames. Ooh, 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 and Jesus. <laughs> Things get a little hot. Oh, oh, Jesus. Yeah, you remember me? Jesus says, yeah, I hadn't seen you in the last 14 Sundays. Yeah. <laughs> when was the last time you talked to me? <laughs> hey, you better thank God that he's more merciful to us than we are to others. Oh, you didn't hear me. You better thank God that he is more merciful to us uh, than we are sometimes to others around us. You know, the best way to guarantee your deliverance uh, in the fire is to serve him when you're not in the fire. Uh, can I preach a little bit? Some folks want a deliverance from God on Friday night, uh, but they hadn't served him all week long. Some folks get in trouble Monday afternoon and they're crying out for deliverance from a God they hadn't served in three weeks. Ooh, I'm sorry, did I step on somebody's toes? Some folks get in some trouble and they're wanting to be delivered from a God that they hadn't talked to in quite some time. Let me tell you what the fiery furnace does. The fiery furnace does not make your faith. The fiery furnace reveals your faith. The trouble you walk into, it doesn't produce your faith. It reveals your faith. I'm preaching to somebody that there has to be a connection between your commitment, the commitment that you make, and the conduct that you live in. Yeah. 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 There's got to be a connection between your commitment and your conduct. You can't just come up and say, Lord, 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 and have no conduct reflective of a lifestyle pleasing to God, and then God's going to get you out. Well, i got to hurry. i got to hurry. They turned up the furnace seven times. Off. You can stay standing, keep sitting, whatever. You can stand on your head for all I care. I'm going to preach just a, a few more minutes, okay? I'm sorry. i got two weeks to make up for you. all be, be merciful to me. I mean, I preached in South Florida last week, but there's no place like home. There is no place like home. <laughs> they turned up the furnace. What verse is it? They turned up the furnace seven times hotter. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face was changed. Look at that. Toward them. He changed, and he spoke. Now, your, your friends and culture, sometimes this is what you'll see. When you make a stand, they change. <laughs> When you say, no, I ain't doing that, they change towards you. They're only like, they only like you like the prodigal because of what they think they can get you to do or what they can get you to participate in. But the minute you say, I ain't sleeping, they change. The minute you say, I'm not drinking, they change. 
The minute you say, I'm not smoking no more, they change. <clears throat> I'm not going there anymore. They change. And they were filled with fury. And he commanded they heat the furnace seven times hotter. Not literally seven times hotter necessarily, <clears throat> but it was figurative that they were going to turn that furnace up as hot as it could go. Now, I couldn't bring a furnace here today. I mean, we got the building insured, but no desire to go through that. <clears throat> They, they, they turned the furnace. Can you imagine just touching your finger in that? Can you imagine that? You smell like what you've been through. You smell like the pastor's burnt nose hairs. <clears throat> they, they turn up the furnace seven times hotter. He says, I'm going to get these guys. And he commands his noble men. These are his Navy SEALs. These are his most powerful men. Verse 20, he says, the men of valor. He said, bind them up and cast them into the fiery furnace. He, he turns up. He, hear me. He, sometimes God keeps you from the furnace. Sometimes God keeps you in the furnace. Just keep trusting. Just keep standing. Just keep living. <clears throat> They used to say some folks got a wishbone where they ought to have a backbone. Just keep your backbone. Just keep standing for God. Just keep standing upright. Just keep walking with God. Just keep praying. Verse 21. These men bound their coats and their trousers and their turbans and their other garments. And they cast them into the burnish, burning furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the furnace. Because the king's command was urgent. And the furnace was exceeding hot watch this the men that cast them in <laughs> were killed Woo! Matt, there's so much preach here the, the men that cast them in were the ones who ended up dying the enemy's plan backfired the guys who were supposed to be in control were the guys that ended up burnt toast crispy crispy critters <laughs> The king's most mighty men were killed. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, watch, ooh, Nebuchadnezzar's temper tantrum cost him the men that were closest to him. Can I tell somebody today that if you're not careful, you will live through the collateral damage when you intended your anger to hurt someone far from you, the people who will suffer the most are the people closest to you. <clears throat> Can I say it again? He tries to cast these three Hebrew boys that he doesn't give a care about into the furnace. But in his temper tantrum, his untamed temper cost him the people who were closest to him. You better be careful uh, what you let your anger run you into uh, and your pride run you into uh, and your ego run you into uh, because it will not hurt the people far from you. It won't hurt the people you're trying to shoot the javelins at. It'll hurt the people nearest to you. And the Bible says, "Woo." The Bible says, I feel the Holy Ghost here today. <clears throat> the Bible says they throw them in the furnace. And the ropes that are on them, they are thrown into the furnace bound. And the minute they hit the floor of the furnace, they are loosed and walking. Oh my God. The enemy tried to bind them and kill them. But what he used to kill them was what God used to release them. What the enemy used to kill them was what God used to reveal them. What the enemy tried to use to destroy them was what God said, I'm going to use to show everybody that there is a God that is bigger than Babylon and better than Nebuchadnezzar. There is a God. Now, how are you going to be in the fire and the ropes? get burnt off your hands and feet and neck. How are you going to be in the fire and the ropes get burnt off, but you're still standing unhinged. You're still standing unfazed. You're walking around. Nebuchadnezzar in the next verses, he looks into the fire and he is astonished. In fact, he checks his eyesight. He looks at those around him and he says, wait a second. Am I seeing this correctly? You know what God can do? God can do such a work in your life that he confounds your enemy's vision. 
that he confuses your enemy's purpose. He checks, he, he checks around, he looks around, and he says, you know what? Is there, is this, is, is, am I seeing right? There, there's, I threw three men, one, two, three, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is who I threw in the fire. Why are there four men in the fire? And the fourth man is like unto the Son of God. I'm preaching to somebody today. Don't worry about the fire. I'd rather be with him in the fire than on the street without him. I said I'd rather be with him in the fire than without him on the street. I don't care if the enemy throws me in the fire because I've got a God that is going to show up with me every single time. I'm preaching to some folks that you run at the first smell of smoke. You run at the first smell of smoke. You run the other direction. I don't know. I, man, this is really tough. This is really, I don't know, this is really rough. You start losing your faith. Don't lose your faith just because the enemy throws you in a little fire. Keep your faith because the God that kept you to the fire is the God that will keep you through the fire. The God that takes you into the fire is the God that's going to take you out of the fire. Fire. All the fire does is reveal the invisible. All the fire does is reveal the power of God. All the fire does is reveal God's goodness and God's power in your life. Mm, you've got to stand with God. You've got to stand for God. Hear me. If you'll stand for God, God will stand with you every single time. If you'll make up your mind to stand for Him in every opposition and against all odds, if you'll stand for Him, He'll stand with you. And they walked out of the fire. They walked out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar says, bring them out. Here's what's crazy. They could have walked out any time. Elijah, they could have walked out any time. They were walking around in the fire. I love this. I just kind of picture in my mind. They got this little attitude like, okay, king. We'll play your little game. <laughs> and they're walking around in the fire. Doom, 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 doom. Oh, this fire is so hot. <laughs> Woo! My ropes are burning off. Woo! They're walking around. The door was open. They could have walked right out of the fire. And they said, we'll, we'll play along. We'll play along. We'll play your little game. Just, just have your little fun, Nebuchadnezzar. We'll just... And then Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, get them out of the fire. Bring them out. Take, take them out. Deliver them. Now, this is a powerful message all in itself. He didn't just deliver them. He was so astonished by their God, he promoted them. Mm. What you don't realize is the pain and pressure you're under may be promotion in disguise. God may be trying to pull something out of you that can't be produced without the fire. God may be trying to reveal something in you that can't be produced or revealed without trouble. Mm. And my focus verse that I did not read in my text is verse 27. Verse 27 says, when all of the administrators, the governors, and the rulers, the king's counselors gathered together, they saw these men whose bodies the fire had no power. Not a hair on their head was singed. Not a hair. Nor were their garments affected. The only thing that was burnt off of them were the ropes that the Babylonians gave them. And then the Bible says, and the smell of the fire. How do you walk through a smoky fire and not smell like fire? How do you come through trouble that deep and dark? We can't even smell it on you. We can't even sense that you ever walked through that midnight hour. 
Not a hair on their head was singed, nor was there a smell of smoke. They passed the smell test because they refused to compromise their lifestyle. And they refused to compromise their convictions. And they refused to compromise they, their worship. And what the king's counselors got together and said was, you don't smell like what you've been through. I mean, maybe God's going to spare you, but you ought to at least have some lingering effects of the trauma that you've been through. I'm preaching to somebody today. I know you've been to hell and back, uh, and, and God's brought you out and filled you with the Holy Ghost, but there ought to be a lingering odor of what you've been through uh, at least. But I'm preaching to somebody here today that you don't smell like what you've been through uh, because the trauma you've been through is so dark. And the midnight you've been through is so deep uh, that there ought to be an odor that turns everybody off. Uh, but thanks be unto God uh, that the God that delivers uh, is the God that removed the evidence. I'm preaching to somebody here today. And I'm telling you, God's able to bring you out. God's able to deliver you and set you free. Because there are some folks here today, let's just be honest, that you might just smell like what you've been through. There's some folks that they let a 25-year-old hurt put an edge in their spirit 25 years later. And they're caustic and harsh because they were wounded. <laughs> you smell like what you've been through. There are some folks that all they're living is a series of mounted offenses since the first one ever came. Some folks, their first offense came when they were an innocent child. And everything else because of unforgiveness, because they've never released it to the Holy Ghost, uh, because they've never forgiven the thing that wounded them or the person that wounded them. It's just been offense on top of offense, mounted one on top of another. <laughs> And what you don't realize is you're walking around and you're trying your best to be sanctified. But you got a little smell about you. You got a little odor about you. But I'm preaching about a God that can deliver you so you don't smell like what you've been through. I'm preaching about a... I'm telling you there's other people in this room... That you'd never know how wounded they've been. And you'd never have a clue how deeply they've been hurt. Uh, and you would never know how many times they've been burnt. Uh, and how many times they've been offended. Uh, and how many times they've been done wrong. Uh, and how many times they've been backstabbed. Uh, and how many times uh, somebody near them has hurt them. Uh, you would never know. Why? Uh, because they don't smell like what they've been through. Uh, they've been to a fire. Uh, but God has completely delivered them somebody stand with me right now I'm preaching I'm preaching to somebody I'm preaching to somebody today that your background is really complicated hear me I'm preaching to somebody today that your past is really complicated I'm preaching to some people today I'm preaching to somebody today that your testimony it's really complicated. I'm, I'm pleading with somebody today. I'm preaching to somebody today that has a part of your testimony you never tell. I'm preaching to somebody today that you can tell about the time God healed you and you can tell about the time God did this. But I'm preaching to somebody today that there's still enough sting from some of that other stuff. But I'm preaching that God's able to deliver you and if he is able to deliver you, he is able to heal you. And if he is able to heal you, he is able to fully restore you in your body, mind, and spirit. I'm preaching to somebody today that your testimony goes something like, well, God's been good to me. Your testimony is something like, well, well, mama was a good person, but... She was unique. Her daddy was a good man, but you know, 
I'm preaching to somebody here today. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, but, you know, I've been through some things. I'm preaching to somebody today that came in here today with hands lifted, uh, but you had baggage sitting at your feet. Uh, I'm preaching to somebody today that you had hands clapping, uh, but you had baggage stuffed under your seat. Uh, and I'm declaring today's the day uh, to empty out the baggage on this altar uh, and say, I'm ready for God to deliver me, uh, set me free. Uh, I'm ready for him to receive restore me oh somebody touch heaven right now somebody's going to leave this place uh, and you're not going to smell like what you've been through Uh, somebody's going to walk out of here today and you're not going to smell like what you've walked through Uh, somebody's going to make a commitment today I am not going to bow I will stand uh, and I am not going to conform I am going to stand out 